During RDC, we got some really cool developer-facing announcements that will help improve the workflow for most developers on Roblox and um, empower us to make bigger and better things. So here are my top seven developer announcements from the conference. So in at number seven, we've got a Studio Assistant update to add third-party MCP support. So if you use AI tools, you might already be familiar with what an MCP is, Model Context Protocol. Essentially, it lets tools communicate with MCP servers that let you do more powerful things. It can sort of do actions with GitHub and things like that. You can make pull requests, make commits, um, all those kind of things straight from your AI um, LLM. Early this year, Roblox announced the open source MCP server for Studio so that you could use external AI tools and uh, make changes in Studio. This is basically the reverse of that. So now you can use Studio Assistant, which is the AI um, LLM that's built into Roblox Studio. You'll be able to connect that to third party MCP servers. It's not out yet. It should be out hopefully by the end of this year. Um, the demo showed using Figma to import UI designs and turn that into Roblox UI, but it should support any third-party MCP when it is launched. In at number six, we've got quite a few optimization improvements, including Slim, which is their new model for cloud-based LOD. So there'll be levels of detail for meshes, images, sound, video, and Slim looks at the whole context of a model. So if you had a whole bunch of meshes making up a single vehicle, for example, Slim will turn that into fewer meshes and fewer assets at lower LOD while still retaining the look that you're after um, when the object is in the distance or when a user is on a lower end device. Early access for this is available as of Monday and it looks very, very promising at improving performance um, and reducing network calls as well and reducing memory for low-end low devices and mobile devices. There were also lots of other little updates around cloud infrastructure. Um, one that was quite interesting is Robots now bursts to third-party cloud resources. So previously, Robots hardware was the only hardware that could run Robots servers. They have their own data centers, and that meant that if there was a huge spike in demand and Robots didn't have the hardware, um, robots would crash. And so we, we've seen that in the past. You may have noticed robots crashing a lot less this past year, even with massive events and massive games like Grower Garden and the new concurrency records. So yeah, robots can now burst to cloud, use third-party services. So whether that's Amazon Web Services, Azure, they weren't specific, but those kind of cloud platforms, um, those can now run robot servers to deal with excessive demand. Um, and that's how they cope with that. A cool thing that this LOD system allows us to do as well is that robots will be rolling out 4K textures later this year. Um, and so obviously that, that very much relies on this LOD system because if you had 4K textures everywhere and they were all just rendering at full quality, um, that would not be a great experience for low-end devices. But with this LOD system and Slim, you can use that higher res texture. And when you're very close to it and you're on a device that is high-end enough to support that, they will see a very, very high res image. Um, and obviously, as it gets further away or as the device gets less powerful, you'll see lower quality uh, versions of that same texture. In at number five, I had importing and exporting meshes. I just lumped this together, but they were quite a few improvements with importing meshes and exporting them as well. Um, on the import side, we got improvements to avatar auto setup, which looked really, really interesting, and also the ability to re-import meshes without losing all of the um, you know physical constraints and other things you might have set up in Studio. So if you've ever worked with meshes and imported those into Robot Studio, um, you'll know that it's not very easy to keep the same uh, you know relative position and sizing and constraints and everything else that you've put on your mesh. You know you might. Be only tweaking a very tiny part of the mesh but it, a lot of the process is just re-importing that and getting it back in the same position setting all the materials and colors again all that sort of stuff so this re-importing feature really really nice you can now um, specify that you want to re-import a mesh rather than just adding a new one and it will try and keep as much of that information as possible the demo looked very very promising for that so that's going to help a lot of people the other thing that we got on meshes was the export side of things so they'll be supporting export to gltf format 
which just does a much better job at keeping all of the um, objects and all of the bones and, and texture and material data that previously you lost when trying to export. So if you're exporting your, your models or meshes to maybe make VFX or make animations in Blender, you'll have a much better time doing that with, with the GLTF format. Okay, so in at number four, I've got solid modeling with meshes. So if you've experimented at all with CSG, there's a, a real-time CSG API that's been out for a little while where you can make unions, you know, cut things away, create new geometry on the fly, real-time in the game at runtime. That's been very, very cool and has, you know, opened up the possibility for quite a lot of things, including fairly destructive gameplay. You know, people could um, have a laser and cut a hole in something in the world, that kind of thing. But it hasn't had support for meshes up until now. So this new announcement is that you can now use those same solid modeling tools in the engine at runtime with meshes and the textures and the geometry and everything is um, sort of correctly handled for cutting through those meshes. This opens up a whole world of possibilities. The demo that we saw was um, destructive things and cutting holes in meshes or destroying meshes. That's gonna be massive. You know, If you think about classic games like Car Crushers, if you had this, that would be awesome because you just have a mesh for the car, a single mesh, and you could destroy that into lots of pieces um, in whatever way you see fit. I can definitely see some experiences of things like a hydraulic press destroying stuff that will definitely come so yeah this opens up quite a world of possibilities i assume that you can also do constructive geometry with this as well so you could add things onto your mesh um, and, and create a union that involves meshes number three emissive maps for pbr so if you've ever wanted to have part of your mesh glow you've pretty much had to separate that out in blender or whatever tool you're using so whether that's headlights of a car or you know something else like that you've had to separate those out in blender import them to robots as a separate object material those to neon and then give them the color in roblox and you've not had much control over how emissive that particular thing is other than just picking a, a darker color in Roblox. It doesn't always work that well. With emissive maps being supported for PBR, being added to surface appearance, you'll now be able to bring in emission maps, which will let you um, sort of mask which areas do and do not want to be emissive, set the color, set the brightness, all of that sort of stuff. So mu much more control and fewer meshes to load in as well, which is always good. There's not much more to say on that, just a great feature that we've been asking for for a while. In number two, we've got configs and experiments. So this is something that I think we've been asking for for a very long time. If you've ever tried to run any kind of A-B testing, you'll know that that is a massive pain on robots. You pretty much have to find a third party system or, or do it yourself um, using something like data stores. It's not a great experience. And similarly, on the config side of things, if you've ever wanted to change something live in your game maybe you want to change the price of something with your in-game currency maybe you want to show or hide some sort of thing trigger an event um anything at all again you've you've had to either use a third party system or you've had to create a data store just for that game config it's not a great use of data stores it's a big pain you run into lots of data store limits and um, it's just not necessary for what you want to do with config, um, there just wasn't a better option. Now Roblox are bringing that natively to the platform, so you'll be able to have configs that you can change, and um, within 15 minutes, that config should get updated in all of your live servers. So if I wanted to hide an item from the store, I could maybe have already set up a config, a, a Boolean true or false of whether that thing is hidden, and when I want to change it from being shown to being hidden, I would just go onto the creator hub and change that value and i know within 15 minutes all of the uh, all of the open servers for my experience will get that new config um, and experiments are basically built on top of config so when you've got a particular config variable and you want to a b test something so this could be a boolean like feature flag but it could be something like changing the price or changing the health of a boss um you know changing the difficulty of something in game you can do that with experiments and the goal of these experiments you can set a target of what metric you you want to see rel related to that experiment so if you were trying to target conversions to paying players you could put that in if you wanted to target d1 retention or d7 retention you could specify that as the target 
So that's really, really powerful. Uh, like I say, we, we didn't have the option to do that before. Um, and I think a lot of developers will make use of that. I think personally, I'm going to make a lot of use of feature flags and a lot of use of um, changing variables relating to in-store items. But it's quite interesting that you could run the experiment, right? You could change the prices of things and just see where's the sweet spot of, of getting people to, to purchase things in your game. There are apparently quite high limits on config. So you could have um, hopefully thousands or, or at least a thousand config items without any issue. And in terms of fetching those, you don't have to do very much in terms of the developer API. You just ask for a config value and the server will determine which value to give you. If you're asking for it from the client, that will go to the server and for that particular user, decide which experimentation group they're in if there's an experiment running and again, return the appropriate value to them. So a given user should continue to see the same value every time they join during that experiment to obviously make sure it's a, it's a fair experiment and has statistical significance. There are plans to add game economy targets at some point in the future. Right now, it's mostly the analytics that you can see on the Creator Hub, um, sort of like retention and conversion. But if you have set up sources and syncs and used all of the economy, analytics as well at some point um, there will be that addition as a target as well and finally number one of course is the devx rate increase this got a great reaction from the crowd as you might expect with a room full of developers um, but the devx rate is increasing by 8.5 percent so before you had a hundred thousand robux and you could um, cash that out for 350 dollars you'll now be able to cash that out for 380 dollars instead as of 10 a.m. Pacific time on September the 5th, anything you earn from that day onwards will automatically cash out at that new rate. Any robots earned before that time will use the old rate. So it's not retrospectively um, applied to your already earned Robux, but beyond that date, you'll get the new rate. Interestingly, this was announced uh, on average 8.5%. I think that might have just been a misspeak, and what they meant was approximately 8.5%. Uh, because the jump from 35 to 38 is not quite 8.5%. Uh, it's actually slightly higher than 8.5%. So that's it for my top seven developer-facing announcements from RDC 2025. Let us know what you think of all of those in the comments, or if I missed one that you think deserved to be on the list, let us know. And if you didn't already see it, we also released a video on the player-facing announcements, so check that out if you haven't already.